Hi everyone, Evis T here. Um, I've decided to take a new approach with the uh, way that I review films and movies. I'm going to be keeping the alcohol, however, uh, I am going to be splitting these into two parts. There's going to be a short, like, five, ten minute review, and then there's going to be these sections, which is the waffle. Those of you who have been watching my reviews before will be familiar with The Waffle. It is basically me sitting here and talking about the film and uh, basically reviewing it, breaking it down and analysing it. Now, I know a lot of people don't particularly want to see that. They're not that interested in an extended vlog recounting everything. So uh, I'm going to split it in two and the review will come out first. And then this will be a follow-up where I expand on things in the re in the review and talk more about things that I didn't have enough time to do in a concise sort of, this is my views on what I have just seen in only five minutes. Obviously, this is also unscripted. <laughs> okay, so Man of Steel. Um, as I said in the review, it's, it wasn't good, but it, it was not bad either. It's one of those films that just happens... Um, I went into the cinema, I watched some images on a screen, they did not particularly offend me, nor did they particularly impress me. Ultimately, it was just a film and I saw it. Um, but I think there is some interesting stuff in there that's a little bit more worthy of analysis. Not in the film itself, but more in what I think the film might have been trying to do. Now. I get the sense there were two very different movies at work here, and they couldn't decide on which one they wanted to make, so ultimately they made them both, and the end result was it didn't work, because these two ideas don't really mesh. The first is the classic take on a standard superhero film. That is, you have a film about the hero, centred on the hero, told mostly from the hero's perspective, and shenanigans ensue. Uh, this is pretty much every superhero movie ever made. It's Iron Man, it's Spider-Man, it's Daredevil, it's the Green Lantern, it's the Batman saga, it's the Joel Schumacher Batman films, the Tim Burton Batman films, it's everything. But there is another way that you could approach superheroes, and this works especially well with Superman, and that is telling the myth of the hero. And... Um, what I mean by that is the film is about the hero, but not focused on the hero. So with Superman, for example, it would be... The movie I would conceive would be Lois Lane as the main character. And the film would be about her discovering Superman's identity, but also about the world at large reacting to his presence and reacting to the things he has to do. And there would be some big threat that he has to go out and save, but the story will be told from the perspective of people around watching him doing his thing, not from the perspective of being inside his head, as you will, with, with him being the focus, him going out and facing the challenge, other people watching him do it. And I think that could be very interesting because as a as an idea, as a concept, if you're going to make Superman more adult, I think you have to embrace the sheer power of the hero. A lot of people debate who would beat who in a fight um, with superheroes, but ultimately the thing is when it comes to when Superman enters the equation, apart from the whole thing with Kryptonite, he's pretty much unkillable. Um, it's very hard, I think, to create actual dramatic tension with a character like that. It's difficult to create a credible threat to that sort of character, which makes them almost godlike, which makes them perfect for a sort of mythical storytelling. You know, the, the average plebeian looking on in awe at this godlike figure. And for a while, I thought that was what they were going to do with it. I mean, even Kurt Russell said at the start of the film, he will be a god to them. No, wait, hang on, I need to do my Kurt Russell. <clears throat> he will be like a god to them. So, I thought that was where they were going to go. They were going to tell it like a myth. And for a while, they sort of did... As I said, the film is in three parts. The first part is Krypton. 
Now, I'm probably going to get complaints on the comment section of the review saying, well, you know, these things that uh, you know, Krypton does come back into it later in the film because it's like they wanted to make the new Krypton. So we had to see the old Krypton to see what they were going to make. So we knew that it would be bad and stuff and things. And yeah, that's kind of valid. But the whole idea, I think, of another of another civilization paving over ours to make their own, that's enough to get me on board that these are the bad guys. <laughs> um and, you know, the, the other complaint will probably be, well, you know, there was a relationship between General Zod and Jor-El, um, Superman's dad, and, you know, we needed to establish that, so when the ghost Echo Guinan from Star Trek Generations take of uh, Kurt Russell appears, then we'll know, like, they had a past. And the question I ask is, what did that past serve? It didn't really serve a purpose other than it exposed, I think, the methods and thinking inside General Zod's head, so it gave us a better look at that character. But it could have done that without the need to have all the Kryptonian backstory stuff. So they wasted a lot of screen time on something that didn't really need to be there. And whilst its presence did improve things later on in the film, it didn't improve them enough to Warren all the time that it spent there. So if I was going to improve this film, and this, the height of arrogance saying how you would improve another person's work, I fully admit that, but roll with me on this one, I would have cut back the Krypton scene, because I don't think it's all that important. Um, but after that opening sequence, this is where I think the myth comes in. Because you've got that opening sequence which, if this was a classical myth, say Hercules, this would be like the the fall from grace, if you will, the um, the stripping of power, the, the setup for the hero's actual tale. And with Man of Steel, they kind of they started the story with Clark basically just drifting the world as a drifting the world and helping people. Again, leading into this idea of a myth of this story being a myth and I thought that was quite clever at first it really pissed me off because it was like well can't you just tell a cohesive story what does all this like him drifting around serve and I settled on the idea maybe this is supposed to be a myth and that clicked enough for me to keep me watching and then they kept in dispersing it with flashbacks and I think this is where there was another major failing um, Rather than telling his life story sequentially, they felt the need to keep like cutting it up and chopping and changing things and just like jumping back and forth and back and forth. And that made it very difficult to keep focus. Um, it's a lot easier to get a connection to a character if you see everything that character's been through and go through it with them. I've recently been watching Avatar for the first time. And I've been hugely impressed by how well they've layered up things on their characters. Now, obviously, they have a TV series. They have, an, they have a practically unlimited amount of time to establish these things. With a movie, you've got maybe three hours tops. I appreciate that. It's not a fair comparison, but I'm just illustrating the, the, the essence of the point. So, you can't really establish a connection with Clark, because every scene that he's in doesn't last long enough to get an emotional connection with that scene and unless the scenes themselves link to each other each time you get a new scene you're resetting that um, connection gauge if you will back to zero because it's in a completely new situation completely new dilemma completely new people and there are only two times in this film that I ever got a sense of who this person was outside of being a superhero one was when um, he mashed up the trucker's truck. I thought that was clever. It shows he has a human side. It shows he has a very dignified, graceful, can walk away from a fight, but at the same time he's going to get his revenge. I thought that was quite clever. It's a bit petty, and it's obviously it's not very Superman, but it shows he's got some actual character. And the other was when he was learning to fly, and he just has this big, stupid grin on his face. I thought, you know, that's another great little bit of character. If you've been walking around your whole life and you suddenly discovered you can fly, 
you'd be grinning like a monkey as well. So, again, I thought that was quite clever, and I very much enjoyed them toying with the idea of his human side, but those were the only two points in the entire film where I felt that I had any sort of bond with this character. It was like he was a really, really weird alien instead. But, again, the architecture of the myth I think is in there up until the third act. Now the third act is basically, uh, well the end of the second act, he gets the suit, he finds the Fortress of Sol Solitude substitute, um, sticks his, this key thing that his dad gave him into a USB socket and a, the ghost of his dad, it's like an echo, it's like an artificial, it's an artificial intelligence based on his dad, basically. Um, tells him about oh, all the wonderful plans that he's got for Earth and so on and so forth. And I think, okay, this, if we put it in the context of a myth, is um, Hercules discovering his true heritage and essentially then actually setting out on his journey. So I thought, again, this 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 film is quite clever. It's pandering around a lot, but it's doing it for a reason, but the problem is the way they executed it you just couldn't get an emotional bond with the character. And without that, even if you create a very stimulating intellectual film, without an emotional bond, I'm not going to enjoy it. I need an emotional bond in the films that I watch. Now, I know that many people can appreciate a film on a purely intellectual level, and if you can, like I say, there's there's stuff in here in the way that the film was made, but not really in the film itself. The third act, General Zod arrives, wants to turn Earth into a new Krypton, and apparently there's like a database in Clark's blood of all the citizens of Krypton, and he can download that and like uh, clone them or something to remake Krypton anew. Um, I'm pretty sure this was the plot of a Superman comic at some point, but I've never been a fan of the Superman comics, so I couldn't say for certain. If you want to know, ask a fan. But um, the final act essentially means that a lot of the idea of the myth kind of goes out the window. And obviously in a lot of myths, you know, the... Uh, great heroes went out and they fought great dangerous monsters and they saved their damsels in distress and it was ale and whores all around. But, I don't know, it just, at this point it felt like anything cerebral had gone. And instead we just devolved into Roland Emmerich action sequences. So, it kind of undid the good that it had done there. And what we ended up with was a film that was constructed like a myth, but it couldn't grasp the emotional part of that storytelling. And consequently, it kind of failed on both counts, because you didn't have enough character for it to work as a story, traditional superhero story, told from the point of view of the hero, and you had the hero in it too much as the focus for it to work from the perspective of people around the um, world being the main storytellers or narrators, if you will. And as a classical myth, the structure was there, but the execution didn't save the film. So it's, it's somewhat confusing to try and explain, ex explain this to you, but... Ultimately, I think that's kind of where the film went wrong. Someone wanted to write a modern myth. Someone wanted a bog-standard superhero flick. So, what else is there to talk about? Well, not much really, to be honest. I mean, like I said, there was just nothing in this film. There was nothing that grabbed me by the heart and nothing in it that grabbed me by the head apart from the approach that they seem to have towards making it. And even then, I might well be talking completely out of my backside. Um, I'm not hugely familiar with classical myths, but it's what it put me in the frame of mind for. So, 
ultimately, I've got to say the cultural impact of this film will be minimal. It's not going to be something like The Dark Knight where it gets everyone talking about the nature of good and evil and law and chaos and uh, the rule of law and the idea that how do you how do you protect a population without basically becoming the very thing that's going to oppress them that you're trying to save them from there's no there's no big questions here that well there is the f the question the film wants to ask is how would we respond if superman was real but because of the final act needing to just be a big action sequence we never really get much of a response. It's just like, yeah, they lock him up, they agree to hand him over to General Zod when General Zod demands it. And he breaks out and then fights the Kryptonians, and that's it. Wow, um, yeah, way to raise philosophical questions or uh, answer those philosophical questions. And I think that's kind of what bugs me the most is... Coming from this production team, I expected more. Um, maybe this means that I went in with expectations that were too high. Um, but given their pedigree, I don't think that that was unreasonable. So ultimately, I can't even really waffle that much about Man of Steel. I'm not going to go over and do a blow-by-blow -blow of the entire film because you know the film. You know exactly what's going to happen in this film. You've seen this story a thousand times before. About the only thing that you're going to get any difference from is how they do the things in the story you already know they're going to do. You know, the, you know that Clark was sent away from Krypton and landed on Earth because Krypton was going to explode. The only question is, how do they approach that? Um, you know that Clark was raised by the Kent family, who taught him good values and apple pie in the American way. Uh, the only question is, how do they approach that? How do they do that? Actually, that is something I wanted to talk about. Clark's dad in this film is a twit. An absolute twit. First off, he says that maybe his son should have let everybody drown. Um, yeah... You know what, I'm not that asked about whether or not his parents have been mischaracterized in this film, but that is a really, really, really shitty thing to say. Now, I can understand that maybe his dad is focusing a little bit more on the big picture, as it were, but really, a bus full of school kids should die over this? And you don't think the fact that Clark is the only survivor might raise questions. You don't think that maybe when they take him to the hospital for the checkup, that something might have, you know, rattled the doctors? You don't think that the maybe just may oh, you know what? It doesn't matter. And the other thing his dad does in this film is just stupid. His dad is killed by a tornado. Basically, everyone's bombing down the road. Happy la li da la 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 la. Oh, tornado in front of us! Everybody, get out and hide under the overpass. Okay, right, fair enough. And his dad, um, his dad helps someone get their little girl out of the car. And I couldn't figure out why they couldn't get the little girl out of the car because his dad just goes and picks her up out. They didn't really establish why this little girl couldn't get out. Maybe the mother just had new alarms. Um, but anyway, they're on the shelter and then the dad goes back for the dog. Alright, you know what? I can get, I can see what they were trying to do. This is supposed to be a heroism thing. They want to present Clark's father as a heroic, selfless figure who helped to shape Clark into becoming Superman. But there is a huge difference between a man who will risk his life to save the child of someone else and a man who will risk his life to save a dog. Now, if this was a dog stuck up a tree or something, fine. But when you're facing immediate death, do you not think that maybe your first consideration should be the safety of the human beings in your family? That maybe the responsibilities that you have as a husband and father 
outweigh the value of the life of the dog. Now, I like animals. I've kept dogs. My first nanny was a Rottweiler. And I used to keep rats as well. I, I, love, I love animals. But really, when the chips are down, if I have responsibilities to human beings, to a wife and to a son, I'm pretty sure I am going to pick the responsibilities I have towards them over a dog. That's a pretty stupid and shitty lesson to teach. There's selfless bravery and then there's just stupidity. So I kind of didn't like what they did with his dad. Um, but apart from that, I don't know, the relationship with the parents was just underdeveloped. The relationship with everyone was underdeveloped. The relationship with Lois was atrocious. Like they, they share very little screen time. They converse. They don't converse. They don't really speak with each other. And yet, towards the end of the film, oh, hold me, kiss me, oh, cheap, cheesy, romantic line. Develop the relationship, please. I, it's, it's not so much, I think, to ask that we get an actual arc leading up to this. I mean, come on, Disney can do this, guys. I'm sure you guys can, you know, work in some sort of relationship in between the um, endless action sequence that is the third act and the weird sort of scrapbook edited thing that is the second act. Oh, it, it, is it just re it just really grinds my gears that we're supposed to care about this character without being made to care about him. Maybe the assumption is that this is for fans who already have an investment in the character, but my argument there would be we don't have an investment in this incarnation of the character. Um, I'm not a big Superman fan, but one of my favourite Superman stories is a... Oh, I can't remember what... I think it's called Elseworlds um, Publications. It's a publishing house owned by DC that do what-if stories. So it's like really cool stories they would never be able to fit into the main canon because it, it changes something core about the character. And this one is called Red Sun. And it's basically it's what would happen if Superman landed in Russia instead of the United States. And it's brilliant. It's really well written. But if the writer of that had assumed... I think it's Mark Miller. Is it Mark? I think, I think it is. I'm not sure. Anyway, if the writers had assumed that we would care about Superman just because he's Superman, the story wouldn't have worked because he's been, he's been raised in a completely different culture. His ideals, whilst very similar, come from a very different place in that he is caring about people and wants to save everyone because he has been raised as a glorious communist, not because he has been raised with good Christian values. So, it's very, very stupid to assume that a person is just going to care about the character because the character has the same name as some other character who also wears similar clothes. They're very, very different people. And I think that was a liberty that the film took, and it was a liberty that it could not afford to take. So, really, um, I'm going to draw this to a close here, because there isn't that much more that I can talk about. I keep thinking of new things that I can talk about, but outside of the myth, everything else is just nitpicking little things that are wrong with the film. And I don't really want to nitpick this one, because it's not worth the time. Nitpicking is something I reserve for truly bad movies, like After Earth. With this, I'm going to let things like the fact that the, the Kryptonian special abilities seem completely inconsistent slide, because it is not a bad film. It isn't a good film, but it's not terrible. It's just really slipshod and rough around the edges, and it needed more time, it needed a better writer, it needed a clearer vision of what it wanted to be, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad. Things don't have to be good and or bad. They can be somewhere in the middle. And this is pretty much in the middle. Maybe verging on bad. But for now, I'm Evis T, signing off.